the Dark Phoenix Saga is considered one of the greatest stories ever told in the medium of comics. It is also, however, considered one of the worst stories ever told in the medium of film. How it could be both is the subject of a great deal of internet discussion board conversation. Um, a lot of nerd rage, I guess would be the easy way to describe it. But if you take a closer look at the complex continuity that Claremont was working with in the comic book version versus the way that the film universe is constructed and the symbols surrounding these particular characters and narrative thrusts, what we find is a much broader conversation about how comics as a medium work when they work. So, hi there. I'm Dr. Andrew DeMann from the University of Waterloo, St. Jerome's campus. Um, I am here today to walk you through the Dark Phoenix Saga. Um, Chris Claremont is the subject of my main research uh, uh, agenda at the moment, um, which is Shirk-funded and doing well, and you should check it out. So here's a little bit on me. I run the Claremont Run. This is a two-year, as I said, Shirk-funded project. Subject is Chris Claremont's 16-year consecutive run on Uncanny X-Men, the largest in comics history, and which, of course, includes the Dark Phoenix Saga. This is the cultivation of long-continuity storytelling structures for comics in a lot of ways. Something we can talk about and how it pertains to the Dark Phoenix Saga. So he's telling really, really long, continuous stories, basically. Um, through recursion and a few other notable techniques. He's also known for his depiction of alternative sexualities, queer subtext, and strong female characters, all of which, of course, are highly relevant to any discussion of the Dark Phoenix saga. Uh, and then the other mission of the project is to force young people to read old comic books in exchange for money as research assistants, um, which is delightful to me, making them read the comics of my youth. So a little bit of history on X-Men comics, or perhaps prehistory, even. They were first created in 1963 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, the chief architects of Marvel Comics as we know it. They were not popular. They were not at all popular. Uh, it, it didn't sell well. Nobody liked it. Uh, they were then revamped in the late 1960s with a young Neil Adams, a very famous comics illustrator. This was successful, but Marvel didn't know it was successful. Their ability to track sales data was very poor and took a long time to come in at this time period. Uh, so by the time they actually figured out that it was successful, they'd already canceled the series and Neil Adams had left to go to DC in order to make Batman cool again. Marvel stopped paying for new issues of X-Men and for issues 67 to 93, they just reprinted old X-Men stories with new covers. So essentially reruns. Imagine if you tune into season six of Game of Thrones and the first episode is just season three, episode one, but they've called it season six. That. Then in 1975, the series was rebooted with a new creative team and a new team of X-Men. Chris Claremont, a young writer in the Marvel bullpen, was then brought on as lead, uh, a position that he held for, as I said earlier, 16 years. Uh, in 1977, John Byrne, a very famous Canadian comics creator, joined up and the popularity of the comics surged. Their collaboration resulted in the most famous and successful run of X-Men comics, the Dark Phoenix Saga, and the second most successful X-Men story, Days of Future Past. From there, X-Men became the most popular comic in the world and absolutely dominated the comic scene for about 20 years and still holds a tremendous presence today, having featured notable runs by Grant Morrison, Joss Whedon, and Brian Michael Bendis before handing it off to Jonathan Hickman's current run. The first X-Men film is also credited with initiating this era's superhero film fascination. So again, X-Men kind of leading the way. Uh, the original idea for the X-Men was the Avengers, but everybody hates them. That was it. That was Stanley's plan. So they'd be a team of superheroes, but nobody likes them. Nobody's applauding them. Uh, as Lee says, instead of being lauded by the public, they'd be feared and hated and hounded and shunned. I thought it was an interesting concept. Uh, worthwhile question, what does that do? We think a lot about the superhero fantasy as a fantasy of being special and important and loved, and the X-Men aren't at least one of those things in a way that a lot of other heroes are. 
Again, not getting that applause might diminish the fantasy in some people's eyes. But for a lot of people, it had the opposite effect. Having the X-Men be unappreciated in their time was very relatable to a lot of human beings, particularly teenagers, who have a tendency to feel unappreciated. Uh, in terms of the broad symbols and allegory that X-Men comics have been known to speak to, uh, the most obvious is that between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, this has been a very contentious claim. Uh, some people say it was there from like issue four. Others people say it was not there at all. Other people say it's a really unfair comparison and appropriative. Um, not much we can do with it. It's kind of there. Where it comes in is up to you and how effective it is is also up to you. Uh, they also do a lot with the idea of acceptable casualties versus moral authority. The X-Men put their lives in danger constantly in order to prove that mutants are not dangerous. Is that a good thing to do? A bad thing to do? A terrible strategy? I don't know. It comes back to Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King, at least in some of their generalized perceptions of their methodology. Uh, again, this idea as well of being the threat your enemy perceives versus demonstrating your benign nature. As a result, X-Men has always had a major theme of optics. Uh, of manipulation and staging and fighting a war through public perception. That's kind of been their core mission. Uh, and that connects them to media culture beginning in the 1960s um, in occasionally a very effective way. I don't think we have a strong thread of that, however, in the Dark Phoenix saga. And then additionally, X-Men comics have been um, identified as um, being a queer allegory for a very long time with a lot of queer subtext. There's actually an academic theory surrounding this by Ramzi Fawaz that we'll maybe talk about later called Queer Mutanity. Uh, which is the allegory that X-Men sets up uh, in terms of representing the LGBTQ plus community. So, getting into the theory that you were working with for this particular class. Uh, for Scott Buchatman, this is where the body imagery comes in. X-Men are fundamentally at odds with the taboo their bodies create and project. So, their bodies mark them as different. Their bodies keep them from being socially accepted. At the same time, the mutant body is also the source of the fantasy. So you get this really kind of interesting, maybe contradiction, maybe paradox, at least juxtaposition, where the body marks them and subjects them to violence and social isolation. But the body can also, like, grow wings and fly or shoot lasers out of its face, which is, you know, appealing to the demographic. Um, so the body is the locus of both the positive and the negative um, in X-Men comics. As a result, X-Men characters become hyper-aware of their bodies and of the body's relationship to society. This hyper-awareness opens up the dominant metaphors that X-Men explore. Uh, adolescence being a huge one. Um, um, this idea of you know being at war with your body and your body is going through changes. Uh, and it's not subtle. They, they establish in the continuity that uh, the mutations actually take shape, typically, during adolescence. That's when Cyclops first gets laser eyes. Uh, representation of racial minorities also comes into this. Again, the idea of the body as a marker. Uh, and even sex and gender. Um, the idea of being uh, rendered into a subclass as a result of some categorization of your body's elements. So Buchanan concludes that the X-Men are feminized, specifically. Because traditionally, he argues in superhero comics, the body is like a suit of armor. It, it makes you powerful and strong and resistant to hurt. He argues that this is a very masculine proposition. And since the X-Men don't have that fundamental relationship, they don't have the armored body, their body, again, subjects them to um, all these pains. Uh, that X-Men is therefore innately feminine. Um, which connects to queer mutanity, of course, because the association of um, particularly male homosexuality with femininity um, is a rich and long and extremely complex history that we don't have time to get into. But you should by all means look into it. Um, my like, like minor grain of salt issues with Buchanan, he is generalizing 30 years of comic story as a singular entity. He's talking about X-Men as if it's one unified thing, not a whole lot of different creators, different eras and different storylines. Uh, and I think there's a lot of generalizations of bodybuilding culture in the 1990s that are legitimately offensive, uh, especially to anyone who, you know, likes to lift weights. <laughs> I don't think you need to be as self-conscious as Buchanan seems to suggest that you should be. Okay, so this leads to the question of the collective. The X-Men are a group superhero team, which is an entirely different storytelling beast. Um, so I phrase this as a question here. Why are team-up stories usually, but not always, um, terrible? they often are. 
Uh, and in fact, if you look at like something like the very famous Justice League, there's not even a ton of iconic Justice League stories out there, the way that there are iconic stories for the individual superheroes that you see within them. So in answer to this, I looked up an expert on this, who is me. Uh, in an article, I, I wrote this, quote, Writing a Tomb superhero book is a very different beast than writing a superhero tale surrounding a singular character. The fundamental mechanisms by which we're made to empathize with a character and feel immersed in their struggles are different when we go from one person to many people. So one of the main things that you get out of this is the concept of distributed identification. Uh, in X-Men comics, it's a little difficult to choose who the focal character is. I think Cyclops is an easy answer, but I think a lot of people would also point out that Cyclops is kind of boring. Wolverine's cool, though. Or maybe you like Nightcrawler. Or Phoenix you identify with really, really hard. Um, think of this as like the um, My Little Pony, Sailor Moon, G.I. Joe, Ninja Turtles dynamic. Everyone's got a favorite. Everyone's got one that they identify with. But you can also distribute that identification in different ways. So maybe I identify with Nightcrawler in terms of my sense of humor, but Wolverine in terms of my sense of repressed masculine rage or something like that. Um, this goes back a really, really long way. Um, we've got Gilgamesh, which is in part a team-up book. It's Gilgamesh and Kaidu murdering monsters. And then it's Gilgamesh being sad that he has to die one day. And then you have the Iliad, which is the story of all these different Greek heroes versus the Odyssey, which is the story of one of them going home. So we can see these mechanisms for storytelling in group versus solo book, so to speak, uh, existing since pretty much the dawn of literature. Um, so this is not entirely new territory, and we do need to be conscious of the ways that these storytelling techniques have been through the ringer, so to speak, and have been refined through thousands of years of complex evolution. Uh, now, one thing that we can see in X-Men, or in most group books, is the idea of the Gestalt protagonist. Uh, the Gestalt protagonist is a situation where it's not the individual heroes who are your protagonists, or who you're identifying with, or who have things like a character arc. It's the unit. The group uh, so you identify with them so in this context you're not identifying with wolverine you're identifying with the x-men uh, and the story tells how the x-men change and are altered and engage with the conflict and solve it so the individual identification can be as i said distributed or the identification at large can be through this gestalt protagonist where you identify with the collective rather than the individual uh, in terms of which one it is yes it's both uh, operate in kind of complex and in simultaneous ways. You are identifying with the X-Men, but you're also identifying with individual X-Men, possibly interchangeably. Uh, so this creates a lot of um, um, different opportunities for different ways to tell the story, to take shape in terms of the relationship between character and plot. Uh, but if we look at the Dark Phoenix saga, obviously the X-Men as a whole are changed by this story. They lose their innocence to some degree. Uh, they come to understand death, develop mortal consciousness, all that kind of stuff. But we can also isolate, as I will in like two minutes, individual characters to show how they go through specific things in the story. So we bring this to the Dark Phoenix Saga. How does the comic structurally distribute characterization and character development? How do they find the time and space to give everyone something to do? And we ask the same question for the movie, in which case the answer is not as well, right? There are a lot of characters who are completely sidelined in this film and don't do much at all. How well do the X-Men function as a Gestalt protagonist? As a group comprising one protagonist, what do they go through in either of these stories? How do they change? Let me answer that a little bit for the comic series. So let's go a little bit further with this. We look at someone like the Phoenix as an individual character. We see a woman grappling with newfound power after years of repression, particularly patriarchal repression. Uh, her love for Scott, her infatuation with Weingard, and the tempting alternative life that Dark Phoenix presents her. This is one slide, by the way. There's, there's essays written on the Dark Phoenix and Jean's character role within it. Let me go to Cyclops. Cyclops is grappling with a changing power dynamic in his relationship with Jean. The achievement of his heart's desire. He's, he's wanted to get with her since the 1960s and the sense of vulnerability that comes with having something worth losing uh, something he's never really known before all while dealing with his responsibility as a leader which he does not take lightly this is a responsibility that could put him at odds with the woman he loves and we look at xavier a seemingly minor character he's caught between his loyalties to his student the safety of the world and his love of lalandra xavier cannot win he can only minimize the damage 
and attempt to atone somewhat for the mistakes that he's made. And there's Colossus, struggling to embrace Western cultural values and preserve his integrity in the face of various temptations. Most notably, he has obscene power himself that he always has to temper with restraint. He is uncomfortable with the wealth and status that an X-Man exhibits in contrast to his humble background and socialist philosophy. Nightcrawler, meanwhile, struggles to maintain his happy-go-lucky attitude in the face of completely unfunny tragedy. He is forced to confront the divide between the fantasy life that he chooses for himself and the grim realities that being an X-Man exposes him to. He has to choose to either grow up or to find some sort of value in the false smile. He's obviously putting on airs to keep from facing the real tragedy of his isolation at the hands of his grotesque appearance. Wolverine. Trying to find a balance between his violent instincts and skills and his desire to be something other than a killing machine. However, he's constantly put in a position where the lives of others depend on him employing the skills that he'd sought to leave behind. Thus, he's having a hard time escaping his past. Simultaneously, he's forced to deal with his unresolved and unrequited love for Jean. Storm. Dealing with her own platonic love for Jean while also trying to come to terms with the fact that Jean's story is not that different from her own. Extreme power, dark side of personality slash identity, um, her childhood as a thief in Cairo. At the same time, Storm struggles to maintain her closeness to nature while operating within a very unnatural world. Beast. Feeling isolated after his promotion to the Avengers, Beast finds himself torn between competing loyalties. In the end, he betrays, on some small scale, the Avengers in order to remain loyal to his past comrades. He also may simply be lonely. Angel. He feels out of place with the new X-Men. He does not function well within the new dynamic, and at the same time does not support the ideological shift that the new team represents. This becomes especially evident in his distaste for Wolverine. Additionally, we have complex interweaving plots. The Sentinels, the Hellfire Club, the Kree versus the Skrull, Colossus's brother, who was an astronaut, Kitty Pride showing up, Stevie is making Storm uncomfortable, etc., etc., etc. We got a lot happening. We also have a diverse setting filled with complex politics, ranging from outer space to like New York and the US Senate. Okay, so lots happening. Let's look at the guy who put this thing together. This is Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont was born in London, but was raised on Long Island from the age of three. His family is Jewish, which informs the metaphor he constructs in X-Men. Uh, in fact, he very specifically channeled X-Men towards a more Jewish metaphor, more or less right after the Dark Phoenix saga, I would say beginning primarily with God Loves, Man Kills, uh, another famous X-Men story. Uh, he studied political science and acting at Bard College in New York, which is right by Columbia University. Uh, he got an internship at Marvel through his parents' connections. Uh, they actually knew people at Mad Magazine, and they tried to get Claremont in there, but the editors at Mad said, you don't want to send your child here. There's lots of, like, drugs and stuff happening. Um, so they referred him to their colleagues at Marvel instead. There he made a name for himself very quickly. Uh, he was offered X-Men when he was 25 years old, which is very young and was a controversy amongst the bullpen. But the editor who gave him that assignment was leaving for DC, so he didn't particularly care if the bullpen was pissed off at him. Uh, Claremont quickly developed a reputation for intense artistic integrity and a genuine passion for his characters. This would ultimately be what would get him fired. When he was kicked off the book in 1991, uh, he was the best-selling comic writer in the world at the time. Uh, and he wasn't well paid and he wasn't asking for money. So how do you get fired when you're doing something like that? Um, well, the editor, Bob Harris, was hearing a lot of concern from comic book stores that X-Men was getting weird uh, and complex. And it wasn't affecting sales, but they were concerned. So Harris became concerned uh, and he wanted to have X-Men go back to like status quo to be a little simpler uh, and, and to not be as grim and dark. Claremont didn't want to do that. Uh, so ultimately, Harris, instead of firing him, they, they made him a very insulting offer, saying, we're going to take your book away from you, but we'll still let you write the dialogue. And that's it. Claremont, obviously offended. That was the plan. Um, quit. Okay. So what he did, 
Claremont popularizes the long continuous storyline and recursive storytelling structures that go with it. So he always has um, a B plot emerging as the A plot is unfolding to an increasing degree of complexity where he'll often have like five plots slowly unfolding within one bigger plot, which then gets resolved just as the B plot gets bigger and the C plot becomes the B plot, so on for eternity. Um, he, he never had just one story being told, I guess is the easiest way to describe it. And it gets significantly more complicated after the Dark Phoenix Saga. Um, this long continuous storytelling is important, especially for modern media. Uh, it is the exact same storytelling structures that you see in um, all of your favorite binge watching shows, um, many of which are directly influenced by Claremont. Um, simple examples would be Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Stranger Things, which both reference Claremont and use the exact same structures. Um, so as mentioned here, um, Whedon was the most direct inspiration for Claremont. Joss Whedon has openly acknowledged this. He has said Buffy the Vampire Slayer is um, basically Kitty Pride, um, reskinned. Uh, so huge effect on modern media. We're, we're just kind of figuring out the extent of that effect right now. Uh, in terms of contemporary comparison, as I said, we see his, his, his strategies, his structures in, again, things like Stranger Things, Game of Thrones, uh, all these bingeable shows. Um, so this leads to the obvious question from a formal perspective. What can you do with a long continuity story that you can't do with self-contained stories? And conversely, what pitfalls are created with long continuity? I can't hear you because this is a recorded video, but these are just things that I want you to think about how they differ uh, in contrast to these contained stories that comics often were um, prior to Claremont coming along. Uh, this also leads into um, the concept of myth versus romance in comics. Uh, so Umberto Eco is one of really the first comic scholars writing in the 1960s when he was already a famous scholar and novelist. Eco says this, quote, The mythological character of comic strips finds himself in this singular situation. He must be an archetype, the totality of certain collective aspirations, and therefore he must necessarily become immobilized in an emblematic and fixed nature, which renders him easily recognizable. This is what happens to Superman. But since he is marked in the sphere of a romantic production for a public that consumes romances, he must be subjected to a development which is typical, as we have seen, of novelistic characters. So what Eco means by this is the comic book character is mythic, so they have to be immediately identifiable and they can't therefore change too much. Simple examples, think about how much people freak out when Captain America changes his costume and grows long hair. Uh, he's not allowed to progress like that, he's not allowed to change. Um, I'm in the movies, think about how mad people got when Michael B. Jordan was hired to play the Human Torch, uh, just because he was black. Never mind that he's a spectacular actor, as Killmonger later proved. So you want your hero fixed, emblematic, iconic. Uh, but at the same time, in order for us to identify with the characters, they have to change. Uh, and you can't read you know, 500 issues of the same book and not have things happen that create change, because otherwise the very idea of change becomes irrelevant. Uh, and then the heroes are never in danger, their romances don't mean anything, so on and so forth. So what you need to do according to Eco is to find this weird balance between keeping the heroes fixed, maintaining a status quo, whilst also allowing them to progress in their lives, to go through changes, to you know maybe get married, maybe go to college, um, maybe do something other than what they do every single issue all the time. So Claremont wanted to push against this. His original real-time vision for the X-Men comics was to have characters age as the book aged, so sort of year by year, uh, and to have them retire, because being an X-Man is stressful, uh, or have them get killed and go away, and new characters would take their place. Marvel hated that. Uh, Marvel was in the intellectual property business, and if a character is retired, it's really hard to sell their action figure, uh, more so if they're dead. Um, so Claremont met fierce resistance and ultimately wasn't really able to do that. Um, but one place where the movie universe can maybe do a little bit better with that, as we see in the X-Men universe, is um, the actor's age. And it takes years to get these films made. Uh, so being able to watch the actor's age is kind of interesting. Um, conversely, obviously, famously, um, the X-Men film universe <laughs> took that a little too far. Uh, and two years in you know real time, our time, in terms of making the film becomes a decade in terms of the characters in that universe and some of them are extremely hot for 50 year old individuals um i don't know that we can do much with that though so for your study of the superhero the long continuous story creates a broader canvas allowing for more complicated realistic heroes how so i don't know 
think about it. Now, the most extreme example of this romantic production, and Eco actually mentions this in his essay, he refers to death in comics as final consumption, which is to say the intellectual property is tapped. There's nothing else you can do with it. No more value to it. Uh, Claremont introduces death into superhero comics, and not by choice. Uh, an editorial oversight led to the death of a superhero. Um, they weren't paying great attention. Jim Salakrup, who was the uh, line editor at the time, and therefore should have caught this. Um, there's a scene in the Dark Phoenix Saga where Phoenix eats a sun and an entire planet of millions and billions of broccoli-looking people die. Uh, there's a rule at Marvel Comics under Jim Shooter that you can't have that level of death and just get off scot-free. You have to be punished for it. So they originally turned in the Dark Phoenix Saga with the ending that you might have seen depending on which version you have, because uh, then there's, they publish it at the back as like an alternate in which Jean is purged of the Phoenix rather than Jean dies. Uh, they turned it in, Jim Shooter freaked out and said, you have to fix this. She doesn't get to come back from this. Uh, so they had like a weekend and they put together the story of her ultimately dying. Uh, this was wildly successful. Uh, a little bit unfortunate that a powerful female character left comics that maybe aligns with the concept of fridging, um, but it was still impactful to a huge degree. Uh, and Jean Grey's death very much opened the floodgates, creating a fundamental shift in comics, where now we just kill characters all the time in a kind of cynical move designed to sell issues, and then we bring them back to life after a period in, like, purgatory or something like that. Um, so death didn't get the consequence that Umberto Eco envisioned for it. But nonetheless, introducing mortality to comics is something that we can credit the Dark Phoenix saga with, at least in terms of mainstream superhero comics. Um, this leads to Wolverine, the little death. Uh, this is not to be confused with orgasm, which is what Shakespeare means when he says Le Petit Mort. Uh, Wolverine, I just use this reference because he's tiny. Uh, and he brings death onto the team, thus kind of symbolically inviting them to suffer death, if that makes sense. Uh, he uses lethal force as a tool of heroism. Uh, he actively wants to murder Phoenix. He just doesn't have the heart to do it. Uh, and he at one point even tries to corrupt Colossus into killing her for him. Uh, so many X-Men throughout the series talk about how they're uncomfortable with what Wolverine does because the X-Men don't kill, but Wolverine does, and Wolverine is an X-Man. Um, so we could argue that there's a sort of symbolic correspondence here where once Wolverine starts killing, then it's fair for an X-Man to die as well. But as I said, that's not intentional. It's just kind of a cool um, symbolic matchup that we get. So to what extent does the presence of Wolverine affect the tragedy of death in Dark Phoenix? Um, I don't know. I think it's adding something. Then, kind of strangely, just as the X-Men become essentially mortal for the first time, they suffer death, they can now suffer death, they introduce the most vulnerable possible character who's about to join the team and become wildly popular uh, in a 13-year-old girl who probably shouldn't be out there. Uh, it's interesting to have this, this moral environment just immediately thrust a tiny child into it. Uh, this corresponds well with the history of sidekicks in comics, which was a way to create identification characters for young readers. Um, I don't know. It works and sometimes it doesn't work. Kitty Pride is, is consistent with that, although we don't have a lot of sidekicks happening uh, by the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. Now, one thing that makes Kitty Pride particularly interesting in this regard is the complication in her powers. As a 13-year-old girl, she is absurdly vulnerable and, and like, like, highlights that connotation of vulnerability. But her powers are specifically invulnerability powers. She can face. She can't be touched. Uh, so I, I think there's a really kind of cool thing happening there that you really didn't get to read much of. I just wanted to call your attention to it and the conspicuous timing in which it arrives. Uh, other metaphorical complexity in the Dark Phoenix saga, and I'll talk about this in nause ad nauseum in, in a little bit. Uh, Dark Phoenix is interpreted as a metaphor for substance abuse. Uh, her longing to murder <laughs> is described um, very much in sort of a, a addictive terms throughout. So she's been read that way. Um, she's also been read in the traditional Apollonian Dionysian divide, which is a literary concept about um, the fundamental conflict in human nature, which is between our intellectual civilized beings and our animal instincts. Um, you can clearly see Jean reflecting that in, you know, Jean versus Phoenix. Uh, and most prominently, she's been read as a symbol of sexual repression, which I'll talk about in much greater length. Okay, so what I'm cribbing from here is an article that I wrote for Sequoia Art 
called Everdash is the unadaptable nature of the Dark Phoenix Saga. And this was kind of a dick move. What I did was I wrote an article about how Dark Phoenix Saga can't be made into a good movie. Like the weekend the movie came out. Which means I wrote it like two weeks in advance. Essentially knowing that it wasn't going to work. Uh, and that I might benefit in terms of readership by betting on the movie to fail. Which is cynical in so many ways. But man, I was right. And while a lot of X-Men fans were leaving that theater disappointed when the movie turned out to be kind of bad, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm a dick. Anyway, uh, okay, so so the reason that I argued that the Dark Phoenix Saga couldn't be adapted was because of its dependence primarily on long continuity. Again, the thing that we just talked about as Claremont being really good at. Um, here's Elle Collins describing it for Comics Alliance. She says, Claremont, quote, not only defined the X-Men pretty much forever, he changed comics with his emphasis on character development, melodrama, and long game storytelling, end quote. This is a thing that movies don't do well. Claremont had hundreds of issues in order to tell the stories that he wanted to tell, and he was drawing on several other issues from other creators in like building character and stuff like that in order to make his series work. The average superhero film based on comics will deal with roughly a three to six issue story arc, so they can't do long continuity very well, even when they have four films, such as the current iteration of the X-Men filmic universe, had to work with. Uh, they're still jumping around trying to tell massive stories in ways that don't work. This exact same criticism came out when Zack Snyder attempted to adapt Dave Gibbons' Watchmen into a two-hour movie, despite Watchmen being a 12-issue, extremely complicated series. It's too big, it doesn't work. The Dark Phoenix Saga is big, much bigger than what you have in your trade paperback. Most people would argue that it begins with the Phoenix Saga, and they're all really just one story, so calling the Dark Phoenix Saga is kind of an arbitrary line that you're drawing. Uh, and this begins in um, Uncanny X-Men number 97, which was Claremont's first issue as the sole credited writer of Uncanny X-Men. The Dark Phoenix Saga doesn't wrap until issue 137, four years and 40 issues later. So if we perceive it in that light, you can't make this into a film. I don't think you could make it into a successful miniseries. You need a lot of time and a lot of space to do the kind of buildup that Claremont was doing to give the reader the familiarity with the character uh, in order to make their movements and their consequences have genuine emotional impact. Then we have the subversive elements of the Dark Phoenix Saga. And let's start with the obvious one, which is gender. Now, contemporary cinema, particularly superhero cinema, isn't great at gender portrayal. They, they love to claim they do, and there's that moment in Avengers Endgame that I hate so much because it's so condescending, uh, where all the, the women just, like, group up for no goddamn reason whatsoever uh, and, and march towards the bad guys. Um... The film world is really far behind in some cases, particularly at the mainstream media. I guess that's the easy point that I want you to take away from this. Claremont was a feminist. Uh, in fact, he actively named characters, including some you know, uh, based on um, feminist concepts, most famously Mystique, uh, who is named after the feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan, which is considered one of the more pivotal works in terms of ushering in the second wave of American feminism. So he's doing cool stuff. Uh, now, my research team in the Claremont run, we did a fun project where we Bechdel tested. I know the Bechdel test is controversial, um, but I think it works as a good like low bar in terms of studying. Uh, we, we, we tested Claremont's entire comics output, basically, for years and years and years. Uh, and his run on Uncanny X-Men passes the Bechdel test 85% of the time, which is ludicrously high compared to like modern film universes. Uh, and especially compared to his contemporaries. So we did a few of the other prominent writers at the time. Um, so Steve Englehart is writing Avengers from 72 to 76. He passes 28% of the time. Doug Mensch is writing Master of Kung Fu, which is a legendary comic series from 74 to 83. He passes 12.5% of the time. So Claremont up there at 85% is interesting. And again shows a commitment to representing women in a more complex and dynamic way. Now, this is where Dark Phoenix becomes complicated. Uh, and I, I think this is actually a part of why Dark Phoenix is so widely accepted, is because the feminist aspect of it isn't really on the surface. It's in the subtext. So Dark Phoenix can be read as another story of how women can't handle power. 
and therefore shouldn't have power, ultimately reifying a patriarchal message. Um, it's not, though. That's just on the surface. Um, here's Ramsey Fawaz's account of it. Quote, Jean internalizes Phoenix actions as her own, interpreting her consumptive desires as an effect of a flaw in her moral character, consequently absolving the institutional forces that corrupted her mind and body. This final desperate action solidifies Jean as the paragon of the neoliberal subject, forced to take personal responsibility for the institutional consequences of market rationality. So, in this reading, Dark Phoenix becomes a story of a woman being denied power by society, a misogynistic portrayal that is rendered even more problematic by the fact that Jean Grey internalizes the necessity of this denial and destroys herself for the good of the patriarchal society. Uh, put more simply, the Dark Phoenix saga isn't a story of a woman who can't handle power. It's a story of a woman who is sexually repressed, then mucked with by patriarchal forces to the point that the power becomes dangerous and she takes responsibility for it, even though she probably shouldn't have to, and destroys not just herself, but it as well. A power that in an earlier issue of Uncanny X-Men literally stitched the universe together with love. And we lost that because bros are douches or something like that. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact colloquial interpretation of the Dark Phoenix saga, but that's roughly what we're talking about. Um, here's Carol Cooper describing the same phenomenon. Quote, Jean didn't turn amoral and homicidal just because she'd been possessed by the seed energy of the Tree of Life. She was only vulnerable to being destabilized and destroyed by the cosmic phoenix force because her normal human psyche was too conflicted, too weak, and too structurally immature to control it under her own individual will. End quote. So thus the question is simply whether her weakness is portrayed as the product of being a woman or just being like a human vessel. If we only look at the Dark Phoenix Saga, the answer can be yes. But if you look at the broader continuity, you see what the Phoenix Force can and does do throughout the entirety of Claremont's run. And the answer is clearly no. Uh, it's a much more complex vision. Originally, Claremont had wanted for Phoenix to fight Thor or the Silver Surfer, but the editor-in-chief Jim Shooter wouldn't allow it, saying, quote, no female is going to beat Thor or the Silver Surfer, end quote. Uh, so in order to get around this, Claremont and Cockrum had Phoenix defeat Fire Lord, I think it was, uh, who was a character who had defeated both Thor and the Silver Surfer. Um, they wanted to establish her power. Uh, they wanted to establish that she was easily on the same plane as any male superhero. We should also note that Phoenix's original codename was Marvel Girl, an infantilizing term. Uh, again, Batman doesn't want to be called Batboy. Uh, calling her Marvel Girl both genders her very obviously and infantilizes her, despite the fact that she's a grown woman. Um, so transitioning her to Phoenix is kind of important. Um, other people pointed out, such as Miles Bowie, that there's also certain elements to the language that you should pay close attention to in the Dark Phoenix saga. Here's Bowie, quote, there is an idealism in the language here. No other Claremont addict reaches for such intangibles as glory and song. They crave pleasure, energy, or power. Sensations to titillate the physical self or forces to manipulate the material world. Gene alone is reaching for something as immaterial as music and as transcendent as glory, end quote. Um, so you can see this very clearly in the language um, that's being used uh, by Phoenix to describe her desire for power, all that kind of stuff. It's not about world conquering power. It, it, it's, it's a song within her which I think is kind of cool. Uh, and then we also have Claremont instilling certain um, um, Kabbalistic symbols. Most famously in the Phoenix Saga, he says, quote, and the heart of the tree, the catalyst that binds these wayward souls together is Phoenix, Tifereth, child of the sun, child of life, the vision of harmony of things, end quote. So this symbolism elevates Phoenix to the level of essentially divinity and a beautiful divinity, uh, a powerful rationalizing force. So, can the movie do any of those things? Can you hand Sophie Turner a bunch of notes and say, here's the backstory of Phoenix. If you could express that with like your eyes in a close-up for like five seconds, that would be great. That would do us such a favor. And no offense to Sophie Turner. She can't pull that off. So the other prominent theory surrounding Dark Phoenix is the whole sexual element of it. Obviously, there's a really clear sexual subtext to it. Uh, a few scholars, Bowie, Dorowski, and um, Cooper, have all talked about how uh, um, the language, again, in Phoenix is very much the language of sexual desire, as are some of the visuals in the text. Um, the one I would point you to kind of intuitively is um, Phoenix with really protruding nipples. 
as she attacks the White Queen. There's a whole lot of sexual imagery, so there's a sexual subtext going on here. Um, here's what Claremont says in an interview. Quote, To use a somewhat gross term, it was the quest for the cosmic orgasm. Her feeding on the star was an act of love, of self-love, of masturbation, probably. End quote. So Claremont establishes a consistent parallel between Phoenix's desire for power and physical lust at the level of language itself. So it's meant to be read sexually. The Dark Phoenix saga also features extensive sexual symbolism through the BDS-themed attire of the Hellfire Club and through the consummation of Jean Grey's relationship with Cyclops, a scene that Jason Powell describes as showing a transition of Jean Grey from, quote, angel in the sky to devil in the murk, end quote. Um, so Jean having sexual agency is really important. It's a rare thing for a comics character, and her seduction of Cyclops is not even remotely subtle. There's no coyness about it. She's just laying down a blanket. Shut up. I got your lasers. Let's do this. Um, so in this light, and perhaps in keeping with the above mentioned gender reading of the story, it's again possible to read Dark Phoenix as something that reifies culturally founded restrictions on the expression of female sexuality, which here takes the innocent and chaste Jean Grey and sets her on the path of destruction. In isolation, the Dark Phoenix saga can become a story of a woman whose sins of lust are her undoing. Women shouldn't have sexual desires. When they do, like, the universes explode and shit. As noted, however, this reading doesn't work in the broader continuity that Claremont establishes in the comics. Jean's long-simmering relationship with Cyclops is committed, monogamous, and heteronormative. It might be the single most sexually normative relationship in the history of Claremont's writing, uh, which has a ton of queer subtext. Jean is also entirely in control of the relationship, as mentioned. Now, how these things manifest in the movie are complex. Uh, Jean has some good points, maybe. Most of the time, it's angry poop face. That's, that, that's how she's being acted throughout the film. It's not conveying the same level of righteousness that the series is producing. Now, one thing that the film does try to produce from the series that I think is actually maybe even well done... Uh, is the sort of moral complications that arise from this, the idea of heroes who are in the wrong for protecting their teammate. And the X-Men all know that. They're all good people, but they're not going to let them kill Jean, even though they have to know intellectually that Jean's got to go for the greater good. So it's a sort of moral compromise that we're seeing staged that I think is kind of compelling, if nothing else. Um, there's other elements that, that maybe deserve speaking to. Um, sororal friendship is a big one. It comes out of the Phoenix Saga, where Storm and Jean unite in order to again help stitch together the Emkron Crystal. So you have a strong female friendship being depicted. Do we have that in the film? Not so much. Uh, we have Mystique trying to do that, and Dark Phoenix kills her for it. And then we focus a lot on how sad the male characters are about it. Oh, you killed our best girl kind of thing. Um, so we're losing that element, I would say, in, in kind of a fierce way. Then we have the love triangle between Cyclops, Wolverine, and Jean. Uh, with Cyclops, I would say the pretty clear winner here. Um, but this is often frequently read as um, like Jean trying to choose between her id, her sexual desire, the rough and rugged, hairy Canadian man, um, versus good boy, Scott Summers. Um... I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's resolved as much as we might like it to be. And I don't even know if it's surfaced as much as we might like it to be. But it is a fascinating triangle because it puts Jean at the center and it gives Jean the agency. She has the choice. These are not male characters fighting for her affection. She is not a trophy. Uh, this is a story about her deciding what she wants, which is a very rare portrayal um, for a love triangle in comics, at least in terms of the gender dynamics thereof. So bringing this all together my bullet point uh claremont wrote this thing for 16 years you've got about five years of continuity that you're drawing on here and maybe that's the ultimate problem of this this movie's 113 minutes it can't do the stuff that the dark phoenix saga can do over the course of 10 issues 12 issues or 40 issues maybe even 137 issues depending on how you draw your lines None of this is to say that the Dark Phoenix Saga can't be a good movie. It just can't be the Dark Phoenix Saga. That's my point. Now, if we look at the major sort of competing vectors of the Dark Phoenix Saga, there's two solutions that present themselves. The first is destruction. We know that's the one they chose. 
uh, this thing isn't going to work. We have to get rid of it. Tragically, sadly, you don't get to have your girlfriend anymore. Uh, and then there's the idea of balance, which is surfaced extensively throughout the Dark Phoenix saga. Note that Phoenix actually says, as she's contemplating killing herself, that she thinks she could control it. She just doesn't know if it's worth the effort, worth the risk. She fears, I would argue, interference from external forces again, such as, like, Weingard, Mastermind. So the idea of um, an untenable juggling act is a major theme in this story as well. Uh, and the extent to which that comes out in the movie, I'm kind of going to say not at all. Um, but we could argue that. You can't talk to me, so I already, in my mind, won that argument, but that's fun. Maybe argue with Dr. Papard. <laughs> um, okay, so, broader more. Uh, we have the preservation of the self in the face of external influence. So when things are changing you, can you hold on to yourself? Be it a cosmic entity or a toxic relationship or a new job that's changing who you are fundamentally, emotionally. That. The Phoenix Saga engages with that. Uh, we also have the idea of death as a tool of memorial. Uh, a martyrdom, a sacrifice that leads to the ultimate symbol of righteousness. Phoenix is just in the end because she kills herself. That's a little messed up. Um, but again, editorial mandated that. Then we have the idea of um, rejecting power. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've seen that before. I don't think it's remarkable. I just want to point out that it is there. Now, if we go meta, let's say, or at least you know, extra textual, uh, we can talk about the conflict between editorial versus creative and how it manifests in the Dark Phoenix Saga. Separation of culture and capitalism has long been dismissed as naive and idealistic, but this view persists, frequently in university arts programs, uh, where they'll always tell you, you know, Shakespeare makes the choice to do this, and you're like, why? Did maybe an actor have some influence? Did an editor have some influence? A director have some influence? A producer have some influence? His wife? Probably not, because he didn't doctor very much. Has some influence? Uh, and the answer is almost always yes, but we like to think of the writer alone in a room with a typewriter mentality. Um, and that's not really accurate. It's sort of a fantasy. Comics are big in our cultural imagination, but they're small in terms of their ability to generate revenue, except for other industries. Other than Stan Lee, nobody's getting rich in comics. Um, but the people who make the movies out of the comics tend to be very wealthy, um, even like the ones who just play Mystique poorly for war films. Uh, so the positive of this is great artists in comics for love of it rather than for the money. Claremont did not get rich off comics. Um, he, he did it because he was really intensely attached to the characters, as we already talked about. Um, there's lots of stories about how he should have left for DC because they would have given him a lot of money um, to betray Marvel, and he didn't. Uh, and then the cons, those artists don't get to make all the decisions when we look at this model. Uh, knowing that the artist doesn't have final say or ultimate control can put us on uneasy footing. Thus, in comics more so than many other mainstream media, the divide between editorial and creative is sometimes enormous. And I think the death of Dark Phoenix slash Jean Grey uh, is a good kind of focal point to foster that discussion, let's say. X-Men editorial conflict. Um, just to give you a few other examples of this. Claremont was a nobody given a book that was about to be cancelled anyway. He had carte blanche. That's what made the book great in the first place. Uh, it didn't last, though, once the book became popular. So when they hire Claremont to write X-Men, they do not care what he does. He's talked about this a lot in interviews. He could have gotten away with murder. Uh, and he often did. He was doing weird, radical stuff that they probably shouldn't have let him do. They just didn't care because X-Men wasn't a bestseller. Then X-Men becomes a bestseller right around the time of the Dark Phoenix saga. Uh, and now all of a sudden everybody's paying very close attention to what Claremont does. Uh, the death of Dark Phoenix, as I said, was a defining moment forced by editorial. Later, Jean Grey is resurrected. Claremont was not happy about this. Uh, famously, they knew he wouldn't be happy about this, so they decided to have his best friend break the news to him at dinner on a Friday night, knowing that um, if they did it to him during business hours, he would quit. Uh, and he actually famously left dinner and went to the Marvel offices, which were closed and locked at that time because it was a Friday night. And he says, yeah, I absolutely would have quit. But he had the weekend to cool off, uh, and then he came back and he pitched a bunch of things, and they basically ignored him. And they brought Jean Grey back from the dead, and thus took death out of comics altogether. 
Uh, then there were additional X books. Claremont kept being um, asked to write spinoffs. He didn't want to. They said, fine, we'll hire someone else. He freaked out and said, no, no, I'll do it. Because um, he didn't want other people playing in his sandbox uh, and thus mucking around with his toys, right? Uh, he's also, as I said, not allowed to age or rotate the X-Men to the degree that he wanted to. Although he did do some pretty cool stuff later on. Uh, they forced status quo on him after an event called Inferno. So they said, bring the X-Men back to the mansion. Magneto has to be a villain again. Uh, and other like like iconic X-Men things. They even like re-crippled Charles Xavier to get him back in the wheelchair because they thought that was important to X-Men somehow, which is really cynical and kind of gross from a disability perspective. Uh, his departure, as I said, was forced by popular illustrators. This came out um, as a result of Jim Lee's particular rise to prominence. Uh, and at that point in time, editorial had the option of not dealing with this pain in the butt anymore. Because uh, Jim Lee was popular, and as long as Jim Lee was on X-Men, X-Men would be successful. Jim Lee left them after, like, less than 10 issues. Um, and, I don't know, maybe unfair to view writers as geniuses and editors as unnecessary obstructive bureaucracy, because a lot of editors have made some really wonderful decisions, and the Dark Phoenix Saga might be a good example of that. I don't think this book is half as popular if Phoenix lives at the end. Um, so, uh, again, I think we need a nuanced view of the relationship between editorial and creative, not just they hold us back. They sometimes hold you back, but they also sometimes rein you in in ways that are powerful and meaningful and effective. So that brings us to the end of our time together. Thank you so much for letting me talk at you for so long about X-Men, which is something I'm very, very fond of. If you are interested in any of my other stuff, please check them out. Otherwise, I really hope you enjoy the rest of your term. <laughs>